It's a great pleasure to have with us this evening Professor Jane Heal. Jane is Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the University of Cambridge, where she's also a Fellow of St John's College, and she's also, and has been for a good long time, a Fellow of the British Academy. She has published influential papers on a number of topics, including the philosophy of language, the philosophy of mind, including self-knowledge, knowledge of other minds, joint attention, um, and uh, Wittgenstein, ethics, and many other areas. And she's also a notably good citizen of the British philosophy scene, having been, for example, the president of the Aristotelian Society. So Jane, um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Welcome. Her paper is entitled On Discussing What We Should Do. Well, thank you very much, Edward, uh, for those kind remarks. And there are good things which a person cannot enjoy except together with other people who also enjoy them. Let's call these things essentially social goods. One small scale example is being a member of a successful domestic partnership. You cannot be happily partnered all on your own. Those who are trying to realise or sustain an essentially social good may be uncertain of or disagree about the way forward for them. Though, and then they are faced with the question, what should we do? This paper is mainly about how to conceptualise this question and relatedly the nature of the discussion which is needed to address it. <clears throat> now, a great deal of what goes on in everyday life, its puzzlements, reflections, decisions, actions and enjoyments, is naturally reported by sentence with plur sentences with plural subject terms. We didn't know whether to do such and such, but we reflected on it and decided to do it. And it worked out well for us. We really enjoyed it. On the surface, remarks such as these record instances of what we may call plural intentionality, people being co-subjects of puzzlements, reflections, decisions, actions, and enjoyments. But much of our tradition since the 17th century in philosophy of action, mind, and value assumes that in understanding intentionality, the first person singular has priority. Philosophy takes for granted that what should I do what do I know, so on, how are things with me? These are the fundamental practical, fundamental questions in life, particularly in practical life. What should I do is the fundamental question. And the, the assumption is that all intentional goings on belong fundamentally to singular subjects. This assumption generates pressure to deny that everyday remarks containing the plural term we or us can be taken at face value as brief and accurate reports of instances of irreducible plural intentionality. Rather, suggests this familiar habit of thinking, they are to be construed as convenient, or perhaps in practice even unavoidable, shorthand for talking about what would be more accurately, even if far more lengthily, reported as assemblages of instances of singular intentionality. Now, recent years have seen a revival of interest in the first person plural. There has been much discussion of plural, or as it is sometimes called, collective intentionality, <coughs> asking what is distinctively plural about, for example, our intending that we do something together. Some say that what is distinctively plural about it is confined to what is intended, in that each of us singly has the intention that we should act together. Others say that what is distinctively plural is the mode in that each of us singly is engaged in something called we intending that we act together. And both of these ways of conceptualizing matters accept the mainstream prioritization of singular subjects for intentionality. And the third option, however, breaks free of this and says that what's distinctively plural is what does the intending, namely us as co-subjects, and Raimo Twamela and Margaret Gilbert and many others have written about these things. And, and much of what is said by them is very congenial to the approach here. But I mean, engaging with their work takes us very rapidly into a lot of technical debates and so risks obscuring the ideas which I'd like to highlight. Um, but, but it is that line of um, a version of this third option which is I want to explore. And I want to focus on the example of a partnership and use this small-scale case 
to get the logical structure of some ideas on the table, ideas about plural intentionality. And if there are essentially social goods at medium and large scale as well, as is highly plausible, um, the ideas will have ramifications for thinking about these issues in social and political philosophy, but that's a further um, topic. <clears throat> so here's an outline of what follows. The paper introduces two situations where questions about action arise. One involves two people in a partnership addressing the question, what should we do? And the other involves a single person on their own addressing the question, what should I do? So uh, the paper next reminds us of the kind of thinking the questions may lead to. Taking them in reverse order, it sketches a reflective monologue for the single person and a reflective dialogue for the partners. That's what you have on the pieces of paper. You've got the monologue and the dialogue, which I shall be talking about. It considers how the topics and structure of the monologue reveal what, what, what the subject, which is thinking the thoughts it articulates, the single human being. The same strategy applied to the dialogue then reveals what is thinking the thoughts it articulates and that it suggests that it should be understood as plural, the partners together. And finally, the paper makes a few observations about what the picture sketched suggests about how to conceive the role of the particular remarks in the dialogue and uh, what it suggests about how to conceive the role of language in our lives more broadly. So, to the disagreement. Here is one of the cases to be considered. You and I are partners. By and large, we get on well and are happy that we are together. But on an occasion arises on which we find ourselves disagreeing about what to do. An opportunity opens us for up to do, us to do some tandem paragliding. You know, you hang in the air side by side and direct yourself to the landscape and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> An activity which would be exciting, but also carries some risks. You are keen that we should do it, but I am reluctant to think that we should not. To you, the thrill of our seeing the landscape from above is vividly apparent. To me, the possibilities of feeling vertigo, landing badly, and one of us breaking a limb are all unpleasantly prominent. Gazing each other in dismay at our disagreement, what should we do, we wonder. The word should, as used here, does not indicate that you and I are about to get into a debate as to what is morally required. It's possible to describe a situation in which the question of our paragliding could easily be labelled moral, or a question of principle or some such. For example, perhaps our disagreement hinges on whether we should put money into the pocket of the entrepreneur who is arranging the activity. I think this person is unscrupulous. No one should deal with his company, and you take another view. But let's disregard that kind of scenario and concentrate on versions of the story where issues about morality, whatever exactly that means, do not seem pressing, and where our disagreement has to do with which course of action would make things go better for us, would enable us to flourish, to enjoy ourselves more. So that's one conflict, so one disagreement. Here's another one. Before further considering that disagreement, let's note that a single person may face a difficulty analogous to that just sketched. Just not true that people have complete and privileged first-person information about what will make things go well for them. It is not the case that when other people are not affected by a choice or moral issues do not arise, then a person will find it obvious what to go for, what will be prudent and good for me and so on. Each of us probably does have a good deal of knowledge about what would make things go well for us individually, but we also say things like, I had no idea that such and such could be worthwhile for me until I tried it. Or, it was only after I lost so and so that I grasped how much I had been undervaluing it. Remarks of these kinds show we appreciate, we can be ignorant of and mistaken about substantive questions of what promotes our welfare. A corollary of this is that a person may be confused and conflicted about how much importance to give to this or that possible element in their lives. A person in this situation needs better understanding of what would make things go well for them, better grasp of their own capacities, to what their own capacities, together with the rest of the world, offers to them. <clears throat> to make this vivid, consider a different me from the early one. This me is unpartnered and is confronted with a first-person singular version of the choice involving excitement and risk. 
I have an opportunity to go for solo paragliding, but I'm undecided whether or not to take it up. I longingly contemplate the excitement it offers, but I also nervously recoil at the risk of bodily injury, which it brings. <clears throat> I dither. I am unpleasantly conflicted. What should I do, I wonder? How might things go in attempts to answer these questions? What should I do and what should we do? Well, here are a monologue <coughs> and a dialogue to remind us of the kinds of reflection which people may engage in as they try to understand more of what is at stake for them in the options between which they are choosing. So this is the monologue engaged in by the singular me, and this is what you have, um, on one of the things you have on that sheet of paper. Paragliding would be thrilling. How strange it would be to see the landscape, the traces of old villages and field systems from above, while hanging in midair, supported just by the fabric of the glider, being able to control it as it hovers. But what if it all goes wrong? What if it induces vertigo? If some silly push leads to a crash? A broken leg, help, help, no! But wait, how difficult would the control be? It's said to be manageable. Backing out of other things has left regrets. Certainly it would not do to over -risk, overlook risks completely. That would be silly. But perhaps practice in confronting risks might lead to being rightly less frightened. Then many interesting options would open up. And this is the dialogue <coughs> between you and the other me who is your partner. You. Paragliding would be thrilling. How strange it would be to see the landscape from above while hanging in midair, supported just by the fabric of the glider, being able to control it as it hovers. You could identify and point out interesting archaeological features. Me? Wow, I'd never thought of that. But what if it goes wrong? What if I feel vertigo if some silly push on the control gear leads to a crash, to your getting a broken leg? Oh, just imagining it makes me feel very anxious. You? Well, how difficult would the control really be? It's said to be manageable. I have a good head for heights. And you've backed out of other things before and regretted it later. I know that I could be a bit rash, and it would be silly not to check on risks. I appreciate your doing that. But perhaps I could help you become a, a bit less timid about some things. Think of what that would make possible. Now, this is all very idealised and so forth, but I hope it's not wholly unrealistic as a record of courses of thought that might be engaged in. So now, <clears throat> the words in which the monologue is articulated do not include any terms referring to who will do the various activities mentioned or will feel the emotions. A different monologue might start, paragliding would be thrilling for Laura, how strange she would find it to see the landscape from above and it could end with the monologist resolving to buy a paragliding voucher for Laura. But the absence of a term like Laura means that for making explicit the subject of the activities and emotions mentioned in the actual monologue, as I've given it for you, the only possible insertion is the first person singular pronoun. Paragliding would be thrilling for me. How strange I would find it to see the landscape for above and so on. So the first thing to note about the monologue is that for it to be about me, the thinking articulated does not need to include explicit exercise of the first person concept. The concepts exercised in the thoughts, together with the absence of a concept like Laura, combine to fix that the thoughts are about how things are for me and what I should do. If the thoughts do include an exercise of the first person concept, and the monologue correspondingly includes I, me, <clears throat> the token reflexivity of the first person marks the fact that the subject of the thoughts, in the sense of what they are about, is the subject of the thoughts in the other sense of what thinks them. So now what further can we say about the subject of the thoughts in both senses, and the I, who is contemplating going paragliding in the first monologue, in the monologue, so let us set aside, just completely ignore radical scepticism of the kind which takes it that we can make sense of there being thoughts which are both exercises of whatever substantive concepts make them the thoughts they are, 
while also being at the same time so out of touch with the world that except for the concept thinking, the substantive concepts are all empty. In other words, just no, don't give me any Cartesian scepticism. I'm just not interested in it. Instead of this scepticism, we shall assume that where there are thoughts, <coughs> they will, despite mistakes being made, enable whatever thinks them to be helpfully aware of a fair amount of what is going on. So we shall assume that the kinds of concepts used in the thoughts have true applications, and the general conception of the world, thus presupposed in the thoughts, is rightly not doubted. Given such non-scepticism, the, the, the conception of the world can be unpacked by exploring what is taken for granted in use of the particular concepts, including the unhesitating movements of thought which deployment of those concepts makes intelligible. Let us note also that whatever is thinking is an occupant of the world, is itself an occupant of the world, is part of the totality of what there is. So non-scepticism means that the nature of whatever is thinking will be revealed, along with the nature of the rest of the world in which it lives, by unpacking the presuppositions of the concepts and movements of thought which we find in the monologue. So applying these ideas to the monologue, one thing which is evident is that the thinker of the monologue takes for granted that it is an embodied being in a spatial world. I mean, these are the presuppositions of the possibilities of its being up in the air, of its having legs which can be broken, and such like. Secondly, it takes for granted that has ex it has existed in the past, may exist into the future, and that things can go well or badly for it. These are the presuppositions of there being things in the past which it regrets, and of there being perhaps things in the future which it will regret. And thirdly, it takes for granted that it can act to influence how things go, including with itself, so as to make things go well, at least in some respects. These are the presuppositions of its conceiving the project of making itself less timid and thereby becoming able to engage in worthwhile new activities. So the thinker of the monologue is thus revealed as a person, an ordinary person, a functioning human being, complex and changing, but continuing to act and exist through change. It is a familiar fact that philosophical reflection in the analytic tradition has trouble with this kind of complex, persisting, but changing being. It supposes that we can dig into, or analyze, the idea of a person. It equips us with and encourages us to use <coughs> various skeptical and fragmenting tools for thinking about the kinds of complexity and change which persons exhibit. The use of the two tools seems to reveal each of us to be many separable items which need to be somehow assembled and stuck together if the familiar being is to exist. To take just one example, fragmentation may be driven by the grip of the idea that what exists at one time must be separable metaphysically from what exists at another time. This idea suggests construing the existence of a person over time as the existence of a succession of separable items, person stages or temporary selves, which are somehow bundled or linked. So in the monologue, again, taking just one example of the kind of speculation encouraged, we might be led to distinguish <coughs> whatever speaks at the start and is excited from whatever expresses itself in the middle and is frightened, and also from the possible future being, which is less frightened, and so on. Now, this is not the place to engage in sustained discussion of the metaphysics of persons and personal identity. Here I want only to offer two observations. The first is this. Irrespective of exactly what account the fragmenting strategy offers, deployment of intellectual resources in trying to think in the terms it recommends is likely to have disadvantageous consequences. For example, entertaining the fragmented picture of each of us consisting of a sequence of selves requires trying to make sense of questions such as, how does the present self relate to the future self and why should the present self care about any future self? These questions are puzzling and the answers are not obvious. If we take them to be nevertheless meaningful and important questions, then their obscurity has the corollary of making the familiar idea of the persisting person seem dubious, not an idea that the thinker can call on unhesitatingly when reflecting on how things are and what to do. And what that in turn brings 
is discouragement and disempowerment of enterprises which are long-term and demanding. To see all of this in action, consider my undertaking the enterprise of making myself less timid by confronting in ways which are likely to be pretty stressful things which I now find frightening. I mean, an initial puzzlement brought by thinking in fragmented terms is making sense of the enterprise and what its success could be. And before the fragmenting ideas are introduced, one aspect of the future good is envisaged as my being able to think, I did it, I did it, on touching down from my first and enjoyable paragliding. But on the fragmented picture, an intelligible focus for these triumphant feelings is elusive. <laughs> the future self is not what confronted and worked on the fears. And so how is an earlier self did it a, a, a proper focus of current triumph? Uh, moreover, to the extent that the separateness of the future self seems intelligible, it seems to become optional for the present self to care about it. And hence, any present inclination I've got to think, why bother, is strengthened, while grip and urgency drain away from the long-term and difficult project of self-change. If determined efforts to engage in self-transformation are not resolutely pushed through, self-development and the bolder new activities will not occur Instead, we'll, what will occur are a succession of shorter term, less difficult activities with the limitations on possible satisfactions which they can offer. And the claim that the present self ought to declare altruistically for the future self does not seem the right logical shape to engage with any of these difficulties. Rather, what, what might block these developments is disengagement from the fragmented picture and reversion to unhesitating use of the familiar concept of the persisting person. That allows it to become vivid to me that I am shortchanging myself by my timidity. The op options available to me are only two, becoming a more resolute person or chickening out again. My thinking resources then flow on in channels shaped by this way of conceptualizing the situation and do not get diverted into side channels shaped by conceptualizations on which the claims of any future self are up for appraisal and possible rejection. So thinking in terms of the unified, persisting, complex and changing person also makes evident the possibility and value of a kind of reflection which is disadvantageously backgrounded on the fragmented view. This is exploration of the capacities of excitement and fear, both of them aspects of the one persisting me. What exactly am I excited by or frightened of and why? How are the responses of excitement and fear related? After all, they are related. No excitement without a little bit of fear, one thinks, really. How intelligible are my responses of excitement and fear? Which of those responses do I find on reflection excessive or feeble? The result of such reflection may be a richer appreciation of the world and how my capacities for both excitement and fear, and indeed their subtle interdependence, are among the things which enable me to live a good and interesting life. So thinking in the terms encouraged by the fragmenting strategy is disadvantageous. That's the first observation about it. The second observation is this. What is right about fragmenting accounts, what gives them their appeal, can be acknowledged without making concessions to the metaphysical picture of separate existences which they call on. One thing these accounts rightly draw attention to is that our conceptions of how things are and what is worth doing are not fully coherent. We have many muddled thoughts and conflicting impulses. Another thing fragmenting accounts remind us of is that there is no guarantee that any one of us will retain our full range of capacities for complex and integrated awareness of time and possible actions. Perhaps you or I will become more thoughtless and impulsive, lose our memories, become demented or whatnot. And if that happens, we will cease to be so robustly present in the world as persons who can be talked to or reasoned with, cooperated with in long-term projects. Although, of course, we may still be present to be fed or given a hug. And finally, the fragmenting accounts are also right to point out that we face interesting questions about the future. It is possible and sensible to ask, how much should I care about next year? What aspects of my future should concern me? <clears throat> but, and here's the crucial point, none of these facts about us 
show that there is a more accurate account to be got by use of the sceptical and fragmenting tools which reveals of each of us to be an assemblage of simpler, more robust and less conflicted items. There are other ways of thinking about the facts noted. For example, as to how much to care about the future, the fragmenting account is right that we can care too much. Being demanding and long-term is not always a mark of merit in an enterprise. Instead, it may be a mark of grandiosity or lack of insight into one's finitude. We can shortchange ourselves by not relishing enough of what is available right now, as well as by failing to be resolute in pursuit of some long-term goal. But puzzlement about how to choose between the difficult and problematic long-term on the one hand and the easy and straightforward short-term on the other hand need not be conceptualised in terms of how much the present self should care about the future self. Instead, it could be seen as about what kinds of life are available to the one persisting me. What comes to light with the puzzlement may be an example of the kind of conflictedness, perhaps unavoidable and irresolvable, which we find ourselves liable to because we are beings who be can become aware of our temporality. In short, we can accommodate all the facts equally well if we stick with the idea that we are embodied, unified and persisting, provided that we recognise at the same time that we are muddled, conflict-prone and easily damaged. My suggestion is this offers a fruitful and honest way of conceptualising the situation. So now, so much for the monologue and its implicit subject. So now, I'm sure you can see what I'm going to do. Um, the dialogue and its implicit subjects. Now to the dialogue. Here are the ideas to be carried forward from consideration of the monologue. Thoughts may be had by and be about an implicit subject which is not referred to by any explicit conceptual elements in the thoughts. Given non-scepticism, the nature of any such implicit subject or subjects can be unpacked by exploring what is presupposed by the kinds of concepts used and in the unhesitating movements of thought which they make intelligible. Employment of sceptical and fragmenting tools is a prominent part of our tradition, but brings puzzles and disadvantages with it. And there may be alternative non-fragmenting ways of accommodating the facts which fragmenting accounts draw attention to. So, if we consider the dialogue bearing these ideas in mind, what comes to light? The dialogue does not contain the words we or us, but these words are what is required if the subject of some of the concepts, in the sense of what the thinking is about, is to be made explicit. To whom would the paragliding be thr thrilling? Answer us. Who would engage in the new activities made possible by my becoming less timid? We would. And so on. We, us, slides easily into the dialogue, has a role in making explicit its subject matter, analogous to that of I and me for the monologue. So whose thinking is articulated in the dialogue? And pursuing the analogy with the monologue, the indexicality of we, us, gives us the answer that it is our thinking which is displayed. We are the co-subjects of the reflection set out. Seen this way, the dialogue presents an instance of a distinctive an irreducible kind of intentionality, namely plural intentionality, of which the actions, enjoyments, and so on, to which it leads, are also instances. Now, could this be the right way of looking at things? A couple of remarks to clarify the question. First, by plural intentionality, I do not mean what is sometimes called group intentionality. The question is not whether groups of people partnerships, governments or businesses, for example, can judge, act, be held responsible and so forth. The kind of intentionality envisaged with that idea is another kind of singular intentionality attributed to things which may be in some sense agents but are not individual people. Its existence and nature are an excellent topic but it is not the one under consideration here. And secondly, our question is not whether the thinking of two people is articulated in the dialogue 
The answer to that is obvious. Of course it is. Your thinking is expressed and my thinking is expressed. We're separate individuals. We're, of course it is, you know. But the obvious of this, obviousness of this fact may seem to support the idea that singular intentionality is fundamental, that what goes on is most accurately understood as an assemblage of metaphysically separable instances of singular intentionality, in each of which the other person may appear as an object of thought, but cannot be present as a subject. But the availability of focusing on what I express and what you express does not settle the question in favor of this view. Consider the analogous move for the monologue. Is thinking at different times articulated in it? Of course it is. So there's the thinking in the beginning, where excitement is prominent, the thinking in the middle, which foregrounds the dangerous, and so on. The availability of this way of looking at things does not settle matters in favor of viewing a person as constructed from a succession of separable selves or person stages, each of which does its own little bit of thinking. On the contrary, the kinds of actions which come up for consideration, how those actions are appraised, what decisions are made, the responses of apprehension and triumph which following events may evoke, are all shaped by the concept of a persisting embodied person and presupposes the existence of such a thing. The viewpoint of the monologue is that of such a person, the I, me, who is its subject in both senses. That is what the reflections in the previous section aimed to make vivid. So looking at the dialogue in this light reveals that the same is true of it when we, us, is put in place of I, me. The viewpoint of the dialogue is that of we, us. The actions which come up for consideration are joint enterprises, our going paragliding, our working together so that I become less timid, our doing the things which then become possible. And the reasons for undertaking these actions are that we will benefit. It is our triumph which we celebrate as we say with satisfaction, we did it on touching down from our first tandem paragliding. Continuing the comparison with the monologue, we saw that the ability to occupy the viewpoint of the single persisting subject and to reap the advantages which that brings is undermined by attempts to reconstruct what goes on in terms of the fragmented picture. Analogous observations can be made about the co-subjects of the dialogue. It is corrosive and disadvantageous to us to set aside the idea of our being co-subjects and to focus instead on representing what goes on in the terms offered by the only singular subject's view. Working in terms of the singular subject view invites me to change my focus from thinking about what might be good for us to thinking about what might be good for me considered singly. I mean, given this approach, the fact that some development would be good for you, also considered singly, can be relevant to my decision only if I happen to care about you, which of course I may do. But given that I'm focusing on myself, it becomes possible and sensible for me to ask whether I care enough about you to do something which advantages you at a cost to myself. Perhaps I won't bother, I think. And when these kinds of thoughts become preoccupying, other topics are backgrounded and overlooked. For example, we will not be encouraged to explore together what your boldness and my comparatively stronger risk aversion contribute to us. We will not come to see with shared pleasure what our varying viewpoints contribute to ours being a satisfactory partnership for both of us. A final point of comparison with the monologue is seeing that the fragmented view, fragmenting view, gets some things right, but that these things can be equally well accommodated on the co-subject view. For example, partners may disagree and quarrel. Also, it's proper to ask whether the partnership is unbalanced, one, partnership, one partner asking too much of the other. Unselfishness is not always a virtue. Invoking it may be a way by which one partner exploits the other, 
may be a marker of grandiosity or lack of realism. There is no guaranteed way of avoiding conflicts. Some may be unavoidable, may even justifiably lead to a breakup. And this is a possibility, does not have an obvious um, analogue in the individual person case. Plainly, the, f the parallelism, be parallelism between persisting person and co-subject so, well, goes only so far. These facts do not show that all intentionality must belong fundamentally to single subjects. Just as difficulties about how much to care about the future are best understood as corollaries of the fact that, for good or ill, we are temporal beings, so difficulties about different views of our shared future, how much I should care about your future and so on, are best understood as corollaries of the fact that, for good or ill, we are essentially social beings. Echoing what I said at the end of the previous section, my suggestion is that thinking of ourselves as essentially social beings, essentially always co-subjects co with each other, the various things we're doing, is a more fruitful and honest way of conceptualising our situation than struggling on trying to give an account of things in terms of only singular subjects. So finally, um, some reflections about language and the roles of the different remarks. So this is all about language, the, this series of lectures. The view of this paper is not that the analytic strategy of trying to understand some complex and interesting thing by looking for its separable parts is always wrong. Rather, the view is that this strategy is just one among many, which may get us into trouble if used inappropriately. There are other approaches by which we may get equally or more important insights, for example, looking outward to the setting which sustains the complex and interesting thing we hope to understand, and so coming to see its role in the larger whole of which it is a part. Plural intentionality, as a kind of thinking in its own right, is apt to strike analytic philosophers as strange and paradoxical, as requiring telepathy or needing the co-subjects to become somehow quasi-identical with each other. Its seeming mysterious in these ways is bound up with the picture of intentionality, which takes radical scepticism and the related drive to fragmentation too seriously. Starting from a different metaphysical and epistemological view, one which is in effect more pragmatist in spirit, licenses other strategies for understanding, allows us to see that plural intentionality is not mysterious at all. The only singular intentionality idea has encouraged a view of the role of individual remarks in linguistic exchange as paradigmatically one person trying to influence the intentional attitudes of another. The speaker makes an utterance intending thereby to produce in the hearer some belief, so on. I'm sure we've all heard this kind of stuff. This is, that's what is said. And there may be episodes which have this shape. For example, I may try to manoeuvre Auntie Flossie into leaving me her money. In the course of this, I may talk at Auntie Flossie, trying to induce in her false beliefs about myself that I am likeable and trustworthy, and about her other nieces and nephews that they are unpleasant and dishonest. But another view of the role of individual remark comes into view if we take seriously non-scepticism and plural intentionality. With those in place, the idea of talking with other people rather than talking at them becomes more prominent. And talking with each other is what you and I are doing when discussing the paragliding possibility. It is evident that we can deliberate well together only if we can call on relevant common knowledge. So one role of individual remarks in a conversational exchange must be to make active the common knowledge participants have which is relevant to their current situation. A later part of our dialogue might go like this. Do we know whether your cousins enjoy it? You ask. Yes, I say. They said it was great. This exchange should be taken at face value. What I know, but have not yet told you, is part of what we know. The role of the particular remark, I say yes, they enjoyed it and so on, is to make this element of our common knowledge usable by us. Compare the singular case. Do I know what other people have felt about it? I ask myself, yes, I recall. Cousins Edie and Frank really enjoyed it. What is not currently vivid and needs to be brought to mind 
is part of what I know. The role of the particular episode of recollection is to make this element of my knowledge usable now by the persisting me. So making common knowledge usable is a key role in linguistic exchange. What kinds of thinking together does that common knowledge then support? Innumerable kinds, of course. Let us distinguish two. One is working out some means of realizing what is already established as an objective. Perhaps you and I have already agreed to go paragliding. The question now is how to get to the location where it will take place. We do to assemble all our available information about means of transport, work out which is most practicable and convenient, or perhaps we have tried to, we have agreed to try and diddle Aunt Flossie out of her fortune and are plotting how to manipulate her. So. But as we have seen, there's also need for reflection when there is not as yet an agreed objective, where there is perplexity about what to go for, where you're uncertain about whether to paraglide. Is the excitement worth the risk? Or perhaps you are beginning to have stirrings of conscience about diddling Aunt Flossie. Is the money worth the lying? My suggestion is that when faced with such perplexities about what is worth going for, what we should do in that deeper sense, one thing we can do is try to understand with more depth and accuracy what is at stake for us in the options offered. We can, for example, try to identify what we are certain we care about and distinguish that from what is more doubtful or less important. And for this enterprise, it may be that exchange of tentative remarks will be appropriate ones where we try experimentally to articulate how things strike us, where we acknowledge uncertainties and are open to new ways of looking at things offered us by those we are in dialogue with. And language is essential to the human kind of social existence. It is not a surprising modern discovery that we are social animals, having much in common with other social animals. This is something obvious, which our hunter-gatherer ancestors already recognised which has been confirmed and spelled out in detail by more recent developments in biological, biology and evolutionary theory. But syntactically elaborate language containing many parts of speech, including the pronouns I, me and we, us, is something which only hum human animals have. Its use does not create the unified, persisting, changing and essentially social beings, which we are. Our primate ancestors were already social animals unified, persisting, changing. So, rather, what language provides is an extension of our cognitive resources. An increase in the things we can think about explicitly can focus our attention on, debate, value, choose between. Use of language is one of the vehicles by which we carry on our social lives in familial, sporting, political, economic, technological, artistic, and scientific enterprises. The big picture in all these things is one of change and development, of facing us with new and challenging situations. Questions about what we should do are all over the place. If thinking in terms of plural intentionality is a helpful way to understand larger scale phenomena, then the early reflections about how to conceptualize and tackle such questions may have wider application. That is plainly another topic. Thank you very much. this idea of using the we to maybe think of it in terms of uh, parts psychology if I in, if, oh, what? Um, uh, parts psychology so it would be acknowledging that there's different parts within each of us and that you know there's a because uh, uh, I was imagining when I was reading this that the conversation that's happening that could be an internal conversation yes, yes. that's going on and it's sort of uh, yeah, acknowledging acknowledging that alongside what goes on, you know, outside and our potentiality to extend our thinking to other individuals and what's going on within themselves. Um, yeah, I'd just love to hear. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm 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 absolutely open to the idea uh, that we have conflicting elements within us and they're in di they're in dialogue and so on. Um, I I. 
um, the, worship of, of the notion of a part, the word part, strikes me as, um, I would prefer aspect or feature as sort of slightly ontologically more neutral. I mean, uh, I mean the idea of part it brings with it a picture of something which should be chopped off or taken, taken out, has a, has a potential separable existence, even if it's maimed or damaged or blah, blah, blah. Still, <coughs> you can wrench it out, as it were. And whereas, I think that the different feelings and thoughts and so on that a person can have are better thought of than the rough analogy of of, as it were, faces and edges and corners, which a solid may have. I mean, I don't want to press that analogy too far, but, but my, um, the kind of complexity that human beings have that I, that I was trying to gesture at here, um, and when I'm talking about different kind of metaphysics that isn't so atomistic and reductive and so on, I was think I was, th I'd rather think of something like geometry of topology. I mean, I'd rather think of, of, of space uh, as an intrinsically complicated phenomenon, as a sort of background picture there. So, um, basically, I agree with you, but I'm uneasy about the word part. I prefer a different word there. Yeah. yeah, in the back. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, if we can move slightly away from the language, um, and humor, sort of a question of two parts. Um, in the first sense, um, recognizing somebody as a co-agent, do you think does that imply an ethical responsibility to that person? Say, if you are stuck in the paradigm with them. Mm -hmm. And secondly, to what extent do you think that plural intentionality extends? So, a lot of the examples you gave were with people you interacted with. But does that does this notion of co-agency extend perhaps to people we have never met before, or could be on the other side of the world? Oh, very, very good question. So, um, good questions both. Um, so, do I have an ethical responsibility to co-agents? Um, um, I am I, I, I'm inclined to ask what ethical means here. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, but, uh, seems a bit odd, that, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm slightly... I'm, I'm, I'm uneasy about, uh, share the uneasiness that a number of philosophers of the Aristotelian tradition have about, about the notion of morality, the sort of more Kantian notion of morality and ethics. So that's a sort of background issue. So, um, so let me just address that more directly. It, it seems to me um, that uh, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. There may be... A, 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 I mean, do you, many different kinds of co-agents, co, co people we are, we, temporary we's who come into being for this or that project and then dissolve and so on. I mean, perhaps, perhaps I get at your question, your first question, by answering your second a bit. I mean, I do, I do myself think that it would be useful and interesting to consider um, political arrangements in terms of um, plural intentionality. Um, I think um, a community agreeing on its political institutions um, or in agreeing on, on institutions for administering justice can perhaps fruitfully be thought of as um, a group, a group of agents agreeing how their lives together would go well. So it's a sort of social contract that, there, that comes out of this. And ideas like deliberative democracy are extremely congenial to the to the outlook that I want to promote. Um, I mean, I want to. I've, 
I mean, the nice me wants to say I have some kind of ethical interest in, um, um, in any, any living being. I mean, I don't know what, what, what let, let me press you further. What do you mean by ethical? I mean, supposing I say yes, supposing I say no, what are the implications of that? What do you, what do you what's concerning you when you ask? Uh, so I have ethical. It, to talk about in the Aristotelian sense, to begin with then, yes. if, if, if I have a notion of um, flourishing as an individual, um, yes. then do I have, as, as, as a co-agent, do I then have a responsibility for us flourishing together? If, if, we, say, if we take it in that in an ethical sense. Or, I mean, if we take it in maybe the Kantian sense, then that might go actually just recognising that everybody is, you know, entering themselves. Into that yes, sort of uh, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm it seems to me the reality of human life is that we, we are deeply, deeply interdependent and we do flourish or, or, or not flourish together. Um, so, uh, um, so the idea, I mean, the idea of a, an essentially social good, which is you know, one of the central ideas I'm interested in exploring, is, exact, is the idea of what would make things go well for us together so, I mean, it seems to me uh, uh, another way of answering your question, perhaps, is to think, I mean, how do we enter the whole business of, of co-agency in the ethical life and so on? And answer, we enter it as children. Um, and, and, I mean, tiny children are passionately interested in what's going on around them. And they're interested in, and the question is, what are we doing? I mean, there's the, 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 the existence of other people with whom they are doing something, even if it's something as simple as sharing a cuddle, there are always other people there doing something with you. And, and our entry into <coughs> ethical life is, is by getting a deeper insight into, as it were, what it is to, to not to quarrel with one's siblings too bad, or to, to, to have a shared family meal, or to, to not to grab a, too much a share of the food of the, uh, that we have at our disposal right now and so on. I mean, this, this is where the ethical the life of responsible action and reflection begins. So, um, I don't know um, if those remarks address your uh, question at all, but. Um, so I was wondering, the sheet you gave us, the materials, you know, we have a dialogue between, assumedly, two people physically and mentally present at the same time is a life exchange. Um, so I'm wondering to what extent are your considerations transferring to the instance of, say, an internet situation, like oh. talking about an online community, like a Twitter thread or a Discord, where people are having a dialogue, but <coughs> the way I'm visualizing it is just a mix of present selves and future selves of different individuals, but the same person again with the potential of going back to the thread. And so, I'm, assuming, I'm guessing it's not so much um, a question as, you know, like, um, I, I, I'm wondering what your considerations would be, um, yeah, on a situation like that. Mm, gosh, what a good topic to open up. I don't have any quick answer to that at all. I mean, I. So, I mean, like, like Plato, with his worries about the written word. <laughs> I mean, I think the face-to-face -face situation is the basic human one. Um, and the, the, the sensitivity to what other people are feeling and how things are going and the possibility of joint action, sort of family, friendly situation, so on, is the... Um, so, and, 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 I mean, unless a child is brought up like that, as far as we know, they're going to end up seriously, seriously damaged. So, I mean, you've got to you need to be embedded in the possibility of that kind of interaction to develop as a functioning human being. So, but now, so we've got all these other ways of communicating, writing stuff down, which hangs around even if we're not there, notices, and now all this Twitter and blah, blah, blah. And, um, uh, uh, I mean, I'm inclined to think that as we're zooming, I mean, some of the things that are enabled by technology are versions of the familiar, um, perfectly okay human interactions. Um, 
twittering. Uh, th there's a sort of performativeness about any sort of human thing. I mean, I'm aware that what I'm saying and how I might strike you and shaping it to to da 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 and so on. The, but the, 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 the interest and the depth of the in-person one is that there you are, either nodding or looking a bit, mm, 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 what's she saying here and so on. And, and there's a possibility of some sort of real... Your reality is more evident to me. And, and so, I mean, it, it, that doesn't mean that people aren't capable of becoming a bit inward-looking, performative and so on, even when with other people and so on. But it, there's some kind of break <coughs> on it. Whereas the Twittery stuff, just you just take off into the, I mean, that uh, worries me. But I mean, I'm, it's just a new form of human interaction. Who knows what will happen? Is the long and the short of it? Who, and perhaps the looping round will provide some. Who knows? Who knows? Very very good question. Christina. So you argue, I think, that we should assume from the beginning that singular intentionality is fundamental or is the only kind. Sometimes it's more natural and fruitful um, to instead understand the phenomenon in terms of this idea of plural intentionality. So I'm wondering now whether if your argument is successful, and I think I'm, I'm persuaded by what you said, um, there's anything left at all of singular intentionality, or whether in fact all intentionality is plural. So the reason I thought that was because um, what you described seemed to me like a somewhat non-standard version of the idea of common knowledge. So in your example, um, the one paraglider says to the other, well, do we know whether your cousins liked it? Um, and the, and the second says, uh, yes, we do know that they enjoyed it very much, or something like that. Um, so in that case, at least as it was described, it seemed as though we know it, even though, you know, um, we knew it before the second paraglider confirmed to the first um, what was the case, right? So I'd say the standard version of thinking about common knowledge is that it's only if both people it's only at the point that it's in sort of in both of their heads, you know, to talk in terms of that sort of trite metaphor, that it's common knowledge. But the way you were describing it, it sounded as though that was not the case, and it could in fact be a, a, plur, a part of plural intentionality even before that point. But now I'm thinking, if it's plural between the two candidate paragliders, then it's plural also between the one paraglider and her cousins, then it's pl plural also between her and I, because perhaps we shall go on to talk about it later on, right? Although we haven't talked about it yet. So, so I'm wondering then just what sort of sets the limits on the kind of plural subjects that engage in this kind of plural intentionality or that exhibit plural intentionality in the relevant sense. Is it bounded by the context of a conversation? You know, and a conversation that perhaps could be sort of abandoned at one point and then taken up the next day by the same people or something. Um, mm. what, what gives us reason to think there's sort of one plural subject there, the two conversation partners, and a different one over here? Um, mm. As opposed to just saying, wherever there's int intentionality, it is plural intentionality. Mm, very good questions. Um, I think... That, that something you said right at the beginning uh, um, is, oh, is there any singular intention until left at all? Thought, I mean, I'm just uh, as to that, uh, um, I mean, I'm inclined to think that there for sure are private, thought, private thoughts that no one's ever going to, you know, I mean, I'm sure you are thinking things that you may not ever bother to communicate or even wish to communicate, and so on. So, I mean, there are thoughts of which you alone are the subject, um, in some sense. I, it seems to me that, um, that there's an enormous variety of kinds of plural intentionality. I, mean, I, I, I just tried to make the idea there is cases where we really need the idea of our point of view on things, and that trying to shrink it back to my point of view, your point of view, we miss something about trying to create a common, uh, the importance of the, the common understandings that already exist 
and trying to deepen them and so on. So that, that, that's just the idea I'm wanting to, to, to shove onto the table. But, but I mean, once it's there, the, the, it seemed to me, well, there's this version of it or that version of it, or, or would you say that this was the same thing? Or no? I mean, it's all over the place in enormous number of um, versions. And it's, it seemed to me something this philosopher should be thinking about, trying to work out uh, what all the versions are, rather than trying to pin it. Well, here's plural intentionality. This is the da da da. You know, just get it. I mean, I don't. I don't think of it as that kind of um, um, phenomenon. Um, so, good question. Good question. Mm. Go ahead. Um, so I was interested in the fact that you said that language is a, an important vehicle for our lives in terms of change and development. Um, I wanted to know from your point of view, what do you think are the limitations of language that impact those developments? And um, I wanted to know as well, how do you think we can like, sort of overcome those limitations? And yeah. <coughs> well, limitations of language, <coughs> gosh. Um, Uh, it, it seems to me that the difficulties in of people living their lives together and um, stem in part from from their um, as with the actual vocabulary they can deploy and their their languages and so on in some sense that may well be a source of difficulty but um, um, it seems to me it's often a source of difficulty. The source of difficulty is people's um, not bringing the right attitudes to each other when they, <laughs> when they enter into an interaction. Um, um, so, I mean, if, if, if one person is, uh, really wants to understand what the other person is about, and so there's a real effort, uh, a real good, a, a good will um, attempt to resolve the conflict, to understand why there seems to be a conflict, or whatever the puzzlement is, to a, a, a real um, interest in both parties, at seeing whether there's something mutual understanding they can arrive at which is helpful to both of them, then the difficulties about um, slight under misunderstandings of vocabulary and so on, I mean, we're going to be sorted out. They're going to, they're going to Man manifest, I, I, you seem to be using this word in a strange way, what do you mean by it? So we can sort it out. Uh, well, I mean, take the converse situation where, where the, the language is as precise as you like and wonderfully defined and everybody knows how to handle it logically, but they've just got two people who mm -mm -mm at, at each other, they're not going to get anywhere. In, in discussions of language, philosophers, um, at least kind of philosophy that was done <laughs> when I was <laughs> a graduate student and teaching the subject and so on. Perhaps things are difficult now, but different now. But I mean, there's an enormous concentration on syntax, um, you know, sense and <laughs> reference, logical form, um, um, uh, all this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, treating it as a formal system. And what, what gets lost is, is the tones of voice, um, the actual dialogic structure where the remarks are contributed <laughs> and, 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 and the, the enterprise, the, 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 the enterprise that the people who are talking can imagine themselves to be engaged in and so on and so on. So, I mean, these are the things that I want people to think about. Um, and it seems to me language will, sort of roughly speaking, look after itself if you've got the other fundamentals right. Same things around we we should um, they're often challenged. So sort of no, we didn't think that, that or no, we shouldn't do that. And um, it, why do you think that is so commonly the case that people <coughs> take umbrage with we if it if it means something separate <laughs> to individual intentionality? Mm -hmm. Give me an example of the kind of repudiation of we <coughs> that you've got in mind. Yeah. Well, we decided that we would go on holiday to sort of 
Sicily or something, and it's sort of, no, we didn't decide that. The intent of being sort of, you, de you decided it. But if, right. if, if, if in right. language we accept that we is separate to our own individual intentionality, why do people disagree with this? Well, it sounds to me something's going wrong in this particular partnership. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it may just be going wrong. I mean, guarantee time not. But recognizing foreign intentionality isn't the kind of magic dust you sprinkle on things that makes you know, people love each other. I mean, um, I mean, I mean, I mean but, but I mean, it seems to me that the maneuver you describe is actually an interesting part of the sort of power play that goes on in, in, in relationships. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's certainly true that so, so, I mean, part of um, plural intentionality, uh, plural intentionality can be abused. So, I mean, the, the, when groups of people do things together, so, um, let me start, start further back. I mean, the, um, the, there are things that, uh, the worthwhile things in human life seem to me, to pretty well all of them, to be things that we do together with other people. Um, I like have a philosophical discussion or have a nice meal together or, um, um, go paragliding together, whatever it is. Uh, things we do together with others. Um, and we both enjoy whatever it is, having the nice uh, discussion or playing the game and so on. But w w w groups who've got to decide what to do, uh, so there, there may be a conflict <coughs> between, for some individual between what is immediately speaking congenial to that individual and what needs to be done if the project common to the, all the, the two, three, or whoever many individuals there are who are cooperating to do the good thing together, there may be a conflict between what, what is immediately convenient, congenial to one of them and what that person has to do to make the enterprise as a whole go forward. So, I mean, to do the paragliding, um, even if it's actually going to happen, um, somebody's got to get on the web and do, make the booking and so on. Oh, tedious, tedious, don't like doing that and so on. And it would be how nice it would be if somebody else did it and so on. Or um, um, if, we're, if we're having a, a, a shared meal, I mean, it may be that I need to get up and, and, and get another loaf of bread at some point and I'm a bit tired and I don't want to get up and so on. So I mean, what needs to be done to move the thing forward and what's immediately congenial to me may not coincide. That's all I want to, to emphasize here. But the corol the, the uh, people don't beha always behave well. People try to manipulate our joint enterprises to benefit them individually. So the, I mean, we're full of wishful thinking and self-deception. And, and, and uh, so if an individual is charming and forceful, he or she may succeed in getting a group of friends to agree that they're going along, having a lovely game with this person playing the rather domineering role, when actually what they're doing is being exploited by this person to, to get the, the particular kicks that he or she likes out of the group um, dynamic and so on. I, I mean, my, my, the idea of there being plural intentionality isn't supposed to make human beings all nice. I don't, I don't, I, not that what I'm saying. I suddenly discovered human beings are ever so nice. That's not the point at all. I, I, and, and so um, the, it's absolutely a real thing that can happen that, that, say, in a partnership, one may domineer and manipulate the other. I mean, it's difficult to be honest. Um, and it seems to me that the, 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 <laughs> the one person repudiating it may exactly be an expression of the thought my interests weren't actually really consulted when that decision was taken. Okay, I sort of went along with it because you were so keen, but I wasn't really, I mean, for sure that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Question basically with Daft. But, um, I'm curious about why you chose paradigm as an example. <laughs> because I'm thinking it's got all this association of everything up in the air being sort of above the world, <laughs> non human, <laughs> like a bird. I'm also curious whether you've been paragliding. Yeah, I've never been paragliding. I've watched it. Right. Friends, why did I choose it? God, I, I do not know. When, when I was, when I was um, first asked to do this talk, I had another example which I was going to work up about a choir who were going to sing together and whether they should or shouldn't pressure one of them who was rather 
shy into singing a solo, as I had a completely different example. So the blurb doesn't mention paragliding at all for this talk. Um, why did I? I wanted excitement and risk. I mean, that was what I wanted. So it just came to my, just because that struck me that they were easy, easy to play off against each other, both as intrapersonal as we had, um, and as between people and so on. Um. So. On the concept of singular and plural intentionality, um, it had me thinking it was a really interesting concept by nature that I can't quote exactly, but he talks about how um, partnership and company can be simply a sort of way for us to confirm our own individuality and our own opinions by sort of uh, entering into a debate with somebody to be able to sort of um, confirm that identity and that opinion within ourselves in, in a partnership or in any kind of company in any shape or form. And so with that in mind, um, I wanted to ask, to what ex or how much can be said, do you think, for the idea that uh, we as humans sometimes enter into a debate or into, well, into discussing what we should do, to simply answer an inner conflict or to hear a counter-argument that we've already entirely thought through within ourselves, just vocalised back at us, so, so as to almost vocalise or concretise like, an inner conflict that we've had within ourselves, if that makes sense? Could surely happen. I mean, I could... You say, mightn't this happen? And I say, for sure it might. Um, it strikes me that the person whom I'm reconstructing for your description, from your description, is, is perhaps um, a little bit self-deceived. I mean, is not being as honest with him or herself as... So they are using other people. Um, I mean, as, as I hear it, here's somebody who's got it all worked out but somehow wants to hear it from someone else again. So, so we could play that many, many different ways, that scenario. I mean, here's just somebody who, who likes to hear the words said by somebody else, a very superficial kind of. Or here's somebody who really wants, who is really partly worried and just genuinely wants to get the affirmation from the other. You could play it at all kinds of ways along that. Um, Spectrum, but uh, and perhaps the, the it, it seems to me that uh, that getting what one thinks warmly and genuinely agreed to by someone else who really seems to understand it is one of the deepest pleasures. I mean, I mean, sharing a joke, I mean, I mean d discovering that there's somebody else who really cares about something cares about it, has, has seen the value of the thing, cares about it in the same way, is willing, and that is, that is something enormously important. And if, if that's what your person, when you say affirming yourself and looking for somebody else, if that's what they're looking for, then I'm with them. I mean, what did you have, what kind of case did you have in mind? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really think of it as a, as a situation in, in which it was just to confirm our own personhood. I just thought um, any debate that we bring up, isn't it, isn't, doesn't it have to be something that we've already, in which, in which case we've already thought through both counter-arguments? Do you know what I mean? Oh, oh I see. Um, uh, I, 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 it seems to me uh, um, that we're, we're genuinely muddled, I mean, uh, uh, sometimes, and our thoughts... I mean, so, so, I mean, um, I mean, what is it to think? I mean, I mean uh, um, words pop up and one selects them and some of them seem right and then you root on the further and other things pop up and so on. It seems to me much less... So I suppose I'm not inclined to agree that you've got to thought it all through beforehand. <laughs> you might have. I'm not saying that's an impossible situation, but it seems to me very often not the case. Uh, I think my question might be quite similar in a way, but um, you mentioned just now that language in a sense sorts itself out. Um, and it makes me, if I can use an example for my question, it's a, in one of Freud's books, it's the two men are trying to decide if they want to buy a horse or not. Uh, and um, one man says, well, if we, you know, this horse is very good. If you get on this horse at um, six o'clock in the morning, you'll be in Pressburg by 8.30 in the morning. Um, and the second man says, why would I want to be in Pressburg at 8.30 in the morning? 
Um, and I think the, the point kind of is looking at it from the perspective of a singular intentionality, both of which you can assume two men engaging in some dis agreement, potential future agreement have. Um, if you dissociate that from plural intentionality, it seems that even if you, under this idea that even in this case, language sort of seems to let them both down, in a sense. Their methods of communication is already not perfect for them to um, even, it, it, it makes things even worse than when they even started. Like, they're not even on the same. Well, the first question was, should we buy a horse? Then it's, what are you talking about being in Pressburg at 8.30 in the morning? And I think the question is, once you, well, two questions. One is, do you, once you consider an engagement from the perspective of plural um, intentionality, do you have to then entirely, from that instance, entirely reconsider even what might um, singular intentionality be? And also, can they even both form be the same? It, even in the same context, if you see, if you have a specific object in mind that you can intentionally reason your way to. So, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether these remarks are going to engage with your uh, interesting observations, really, but I'm, in, I'm inclined to think that our... Um, that any person's understanding of, of the world is, uh, sort of as where Wittgenstein said, light dawns gradually over the whole. Uh, so, so that, that um, we're, we're, we're always filling in m more, uh, I mean, we, we, we live alongside other people whom we understand to some extent, or whose, whose outlook on the world we share to some extent. But, but I mean, we're often trying to fill in bits of, of, of the picture that we haven't got. Um, so and it seems to me your people, I mean, I, I don't have a clear picture of your people, but they seem to be starting <laughs> and from very different... Have I got it right? They're just starting from completely different... Why are they entering into dialogue at all? Are they friends? What are they doing? To, I, mean, I mean, I don't have any sense of where, the, where they're coming from that I well, could... It could be, I mean, it's, it's a rough thing, so I think you could think of it in different ways, but the way I think about it is, let's say it's business partners or family members, whatever, there's some agenda on the table of which they have some respective relative understanding of what the agenda is, which is, in this case, is this horse something we should buy? Right. Um, a relatively narrow context, you can kind of understand what they're trying to achieve here. Right. But then it's the means by which a plural intentionality might express itself or evolve or even you know, uh, come to be whatever. That seems to, in a sense, suddenly they're not even on the same ground in the first place, <coughs> if you see. Uh, now it's not simply a question mm. of doing by a horse. Now it's, you know, we both have the same means of communication, but I'm now asking entirely different questions. Okay, right. So, um, so, I mean, I've, I'm, I, all I'm inclined to say is that you may think that you, you have the mutual understanding with somebody else and then discover that it doesn't exist. I mean, I, I'm, that seems to me perfectly possible. Um, so nothing and nothing I've said um, rules that out. And if you discover yourself, gosh, what are you saying that for? I never, and so on and so on. Then you'll have to shrink back and, and see whether you can, so that's not the word, right word. Then you'll have, to, if you want to continue communication, you'll have to cast about a bit and see if you can find any common ground from which you reasonably secure that you understand each other, from which you can then build out again. But, um, so you, yes, yeah. 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question about the idea of co-agency. Because yes. when, when you finished your talk, um, we'd arrived at the point of co-agency. And I was just wondering, we use we all the time to talk about um, times when there's not necessarily a co-agency so much as an interaction between two agents, like a transaction of some kind when you agree to, as, as we just said, purchase something. You can enter into a fruitful dialogue without having any co-agency so much as collaboration. I just wonder at what point that we kind of dissolves itself, or the co-agency that you've stated is in that we dissolves itself into nothing essentially other than the two agents, as we had a we that can be negated mm. and you have mm. Mm. a we that can be projected. You have a thing <coughs> that from the outside may look like a we, but from the inside may not. At what point does that kind of dissolve mm. itself entirely? Mm. Mm. That there are many uses of we and quite a lot of which don't express co-agency. I mean, I may say we philosophers, or we women, or we Brits, or, and um, just generalizing about a group of which I happen to be a member. I mean, there's no necessarily co-agency implied there. Um, um, there's, so there are many different uses of, of things in indexical pronouns. Um, and there's the the the, the I mean, uh, other languages are much more subtle in marking these kinds of differences. For example, if, if people are in a, a dialogue, so as it were, Edward and me on one side of the table talking to various of you on the other side of the table, then there's one we that means Edward and me, and another we which means all of us here and so on. So there's I mean, whole, whole, whole loads of different kinds of we. And uh, so I just have to... Um, you put up my hand and say there are many and they need sorting out. You asked, um, so they need sorting out. It's not a question of of uh, of uh, co-agency, plural intention, dissolving or not dissolving or whatever. I mean, just as a response to Christina's question, there's an, in, an enormous complexity of human phenomena here, and we're just blinkering ourselves to this enormous complexity if we go at everything with the with only the determined to boil it all down to <coughs> some assemblage of singular intention not it that's that's uh, uh, saying yeah but so it's sort of follow on from the from the last question i wonder whether you could reflect a little bit on the difference between as it were two ways one might portray your dialogue on the handout one is two people reasoning together about what one of them should do, or even two people reasoning together about what each of them should do, yes. and on the other hand, two people reasoning about what they should do together, if you see what I mean. It's about yes. the scope of yes. the together. So it seems you, you, can, you can have people dialoguing, and that's a joint activity, yes. but about what each of them should do. Yes, 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 yes. And then, but but the, it's a different phenomenon where the, a, a sort of deeper plurality of the subject, if you like, where what yes, they're reasoning yes. about is a joint activity. Yes, I, 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 I just have to say that I agree with that. Um, so, uh, so if... Uh, um, so I'm just repeating you here, Edward. I mean, you and I... Uh, uh, so I may come to you for advice on what I should do. And then you and I can work out together, or I can ask her advice on what I should do, and that's perfectly, I mean, so, so a dialogue or, or, a, or a discussion of this kind can have any topic at all. I mean, you know, it's two plus two, four, I mean, uh, whatever. I mean, what should we think about this, that, or the other? I mean, we, so, um, but so, so the point of, of, of taking a particular dialogue which was focused on the practical question of what we should do, not what you should do or I should do or what Laura should do or so on, was simply to bring, to make vivid the possibility of conceiving, sorry, to, to, to use that dialogue to, as a possible expression presented as an expression, analysed an expression of a perplexity about co-agency um, to, to recommend the idea of 
that there is claw intention and there is co-agency. I mean, that, so, so I, it's one particular kind of dialogue which I'm, to which I'm trying to present as a, what you helpfully seen as that kind of articulation. Very good. Thank you. And thank you indeed for the talk. And thank you all for your participation both this evening and over the course of this whole term's lectures. Let's thank Jane once again.